Good evening. I'm Sarah Elliott Holliday from the library staff, and I'm just here to welcome you on behalf of the library and to say a quick word about tonight's speaker. Hawa Allen writes cultural criticism, fiction, and poetry. She's a lecturer at the New School and an essay editor at The Offing. Her work has appeared among other places in The Baffler, The Chicago Tribune, Lapham's Quarterly, and Tricycle Magazine, where she's a contributing editor. She's recently published pieces on wide ranging topics, including the January 21, 2021 Storming of the US Capitol in Time magazine and the underappreciated author Bill Gunn for the literary journal Epiphany. Patricia J. Williams says of tonight's book, Insurrection, Allen's profoundly moving book exposes the emotional underbelly of slavery's traumatic legacy on both enslavers and enslaved and on all the generations since. The affective echo of that moral crisis remains entangled in today's most urgent conflagrations. In a moment as deeply divided as ours, Allen's book offers principled and reflective pause. I urge you to add your questions and comments to the chat, which you'll see at the right of your screen throughout the presentation, and Ms. Allen will speak to them later in the evening. I will now hand the virtual stage to Hawa Allen. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank uh, both you, Sarah, and uh, the New York Society Library for inviting me. This is a great honor uh, to be able to present my work in this forum. So to start, I just wanted to display this image. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but in case it happens to be new to anyone who's watching, I just want to give you a few seconds to absorb it. So on the one hand, you can look in this image and perhaps see a profile of a duck looking upwards and to the left with the bills of the duck angling toward the upper left-hand corner of the page. However, on the other hand, a rabbit is also visible with what might have otherwise been the bills of the duck now apparent as the ears of the rabbit. And that profile is looking toward the right-hand side of the frame. So this famous, famous image is often referred to as the duck-rabbit illusion. And it was used by the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein to illustrate the phenomenon where an object in the field of one's perception doesn't simply exist in and of itself, meaning on its own side, but rather is filtered through the concepts that the viewer brings to the object. So while the object itself is static, the viewer's perception of the object can shift back and forth. So, you know, perhaps someone who grew up by a duck pond, for example, might immediately see the duck and uh, have to be informed that a rabbit also lurked within the image. And then, you know, eventually the, the rabbit could then be seen through a shift in per perception. So in my book, I refer to this image to illustrate what I call the paradoxical state of black citizenship. And that's where the black citizen is also an unstable image. So I would like to hold, I would like you to, you know, just hold this picture in mind because I will, I will re, we'll return to it later uh, with the intention of this analogy becoming uh, much clearer. So the paradoxical state of black citizenship is part of the subtitle of my book, Insurrection, which interweaves legal history and personal narrative in a discussion of the Insurrection Act of 1807, which allows the president to domestically deploy federal troops and or federalize the National Guard to suppress domestic violence, unlawful combinations, or insurrections. So I actually stumbled upon the Insurrection Act while looking into the Hurricane Katrina crisis. I think there are certain key images and events that gener generally stick in one's mind from this time when the hurricane ripped into Louisiana and breached critical levees and submerged a substantial portion of New Orleans, New Orleans underwater, leaving mostly black residents who did not evacuate stranded. And these were people often referred to in the media as refugees. Um, Soledad O'Brien, for one, lamented the fact that the federal response was taking so long. She referred to the fact that the federal aid had reached Indonesia much faster in response to a recent tsunami than it had domestically within Louisiana. And of course, Kanye West, while on a telethon soliciting donations to help, her, to help hurricane victims, 
made an ad hoc quip that George Bush doesn't care about black people. There were also the optics of George W. Bush flying over Louisiana in a plane, perhaps illustrating the seeming remove he had from the immediate crisis on the ground, which he was considering from a distant aerial view. So when looking into this event, I found that then governor of Louisiana, Kathleen Blanco, had made a formal request of the George W. Bush administration to provide federal aid under the Stafford Act, which is legislation that sets forth the terms for facilitating federal help to state officials in the event of a man-made or natural disaster. This request would have covered any aid provided by federal troops also dispatched by the executive. However, George W. Bush hesitated to dispatch federal troops in New Orleans, in particular under the authority of the Stafford Act, because under that act, federal troops would not have been authorized to assume powers of local law enforcement, such as the authority to make searches, searches, seizures, and arrests of suspects. Instead, Bush wanted to invoke the Insurrection Act, which would have conferred such powers to dispatch troops as part of an overall mission to restore law and order in the event of an insurrection or domestic unrest. So in his defense, Bush claimed that he was concerned about circulating reports on the ground that New Orleans had erupted into violence, which had turned out to be largely exaggerated and some of which even false. Nonetheless, these reports, including rooftop snipers, violent armed gangs, and the, make and the makeshift shelter of the Superdome, basically turning into a domain of murder and rape, um, these reports influenced both Bush and even Governor Blanco and, and then Mayor Ray Nagin, who repeated them. In a press conference, uh, Blanco referred to National Guard troops that she was borrowing from nearby states to respond to the crisis and said they have M16s and that they're locked and loaded and these troops know how to shoot to kill. Uh, all that said, Governor Blanco did not want George W. Bush to invoke the Insurrection Act, largely because it would have made the president the commander in chief of the military response on the ground and she wanted to re retain that role as governor. So I found out that Bush and Blanco argued about this for days until Bush finally relented and dispatched the federal troops under the Stafford Act. Even though he could have decided to invoke this uh, act, uh, the Insurrection Act unilaterally, he was reluctant to do so because as he said in his memoir, Decision Points, and I'm gonna cite him directly because it's a pretty striking quote. He said, if I invoked the Insurrection Act against her wishes, the world would see a male Republican president usurping the authority of a female Democratic governor by declaring an insurrection in a largely African-American city. That would arouse controversy anywhere. And he continued, to do so in the Deep South, where there had been centuries of states' rights tensions, could unleash holy hell. So looking at all of this, I wondered, you know, what he could possibly be talking about. And I decided to do more research on the Insurrection Act and its other invocations. When doing so, I found that it had been used to respond to incidents that were well known in US history, African-American history in particular, even if the act itself was relatively obscure. So many people likely first heard of the Insurrection Act uh, when Donald Trump threatened to invoke it in response to the George Floyd uprisings in 2020. But most recently, it was used to respond to the Los Angeles riots following the acquittal of officers involved in beating Rodney King. And that was when George H.W. Bush invoked it in 1992. It was also used to respond to the riots that broke out in DC, Chicago, and Baltimore in 1968 after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And it was used to protect the constitutional rights of civil rights protesters marching from Selma to Montgomery in an incident you know, that is fairly well known to follow the Bloody Sunday beatings um, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And it was used in response to both the Detroit riots of 1967 as well as 1943 and to desegregate public schools in Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas and moving even further back, the act was used to respond to what is called Bleeding Kansas, that where pro and anti-slavery forces who were clashing in the then ter territory of Kansas 
over whether uh, that territory would be a free or slave, slave state. Um, and notoriously, John Brown was involved in uh, a lot of that uh, back and forth. So the act has also been linked by military historians to the suppression of the Nat Turner Rebellion. And I believe arguably was used to dispatch federal troops to Fort uh, Sumter, marking the start of the Civil War. So what is interesting is that the language in the Reconstruction Acts, as well as the Enforcement Acts that were passed you know, in, in the post-Civil War era in the South, with the first obviously authorizing the federal military administration of the South after the Civil War, and the latter used uh, under the administration of Ulysses S. Grant to call forth the militia to combat the Ku Klux Klan. Both of these acts seem to even incorporate language that is very similar to the Insurrection Act, um, which I figure could mean that the act could very well have been a precedent for both, at least as far as the actual text of that legislation is involved. So ultimately in the book, I make the point that the invocation of the act reveals a pattern in that it was largely used to either suppress eruptions against slave powers or so-called race riots as they uh, were transfigured in the you know, uh, post-Civil War era, or to enforce the civil rights of African-Americans. So what is significant about this is that the Insurrection Act re represents an extraordinary power conferred to the executive branch to you know, essentially deploy federal troops to suppress civil unrest. Because it was considered such an extraordinary power and a disruption of federalism, where it's typically the governor that is the commander in chief of the state national guard and therefore any military response within uh, the jurisdiction of their state. I noticed in reading the backstory to many of these events that the presidents were generally very reluctant to use this power. So in light of this reluctance, it's remarkable to see this parallel with key events in African-American history, which I argue in the book reflects the ongoing and bloody battle to fully incorporate Black Americans as full citizens of the United States. So ultimately, I discussed that progress made by traveling along that famous moral arc that bends toward justice has been made with respect to Black citizens Black citizenship in the United States as concessions in this ongoing and bloody battle, where the Insurrection Act invocations are flashpoints, representing extreme incidents where federal military power was invoked to restore order. So while it's clear that the 13th, 14th, and 15th, 15th Amendments were enacted after the Civil War, it is lesser known, for example, that the Civil Rights, of, Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed soon after, the, after George Wallace's famous stand in the schoolhouse door, and that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed soon after the famous Bloody Sunday Battle, uh, Bloody Sunday Battle on the Edmund Pettus Bridge that uh, originally marred the early attempt of uh, civil rights protesters to march from Selma to Montgomery. So, Quickly returning to Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, this backstory, this back history uh, provided context for George W. Bush's quote in his memoir, Decision Points. So even though in the end, Bush did not end up invoking the Insurrection Act um, and, you know, dispatched troops uh, were sent under the authority of the Stafford Act instead, this incident, among many others that I discuss in the book, illustrates this duality that becomes clear when considering the overall pattern that emerges from Insurrection Act invocations, both the actual and the threatened ones, where the Black citizen or, you know, prior to emancipation, the African-born or descended person, whether or not enslaved, is treated as both ward and enemy of the state. With Katrina in particular, this duality or liminality is striking where the mostly black storm victims were perceived as both relief seeking and rioting, as well as both resident and refugee. So this encapsulates this enduring, stig enduring stigma of the black citizen as a potential insurrectionist and as you know, not even being a citizen at, at all. At the founding of the United States, the term black citizen uh, obviously was an oxymoron and the enslaved were the object of an architecture of surveillance, suppression, and enforcement aimed at maintaining the slave system. The white citizen or the original citizen 
was not only the de facto citizen, but it was also effectively deputized by law to help enforce the slave system. One prime example is the Fugitive Slave Act, which deputized all white citizens to participate in the capture and return of fugitive, sl fugitive slaves, authorizing federal marshals to summon civilians to help enforce this law. So specifically, the 1850 Act stated in part that all good citizens are hereby commanded to aid and assist in the prompt and efficient execution of this law. However, this kind of deputizing was implicit in the text of many antebellum laws, as uh, the great Winthrop Jordan um, points out in his classic text, White Over Black, the law told the white man, not the Negro, what he must do. It was the white man who was required to punish his runaways, prevent assemblages of slaves, enforce curfews, sit on the special courts, and ride the patrols. As I also pointed out, uh, as it was in many cases illegal for the enslaved to become literate, that would make it doubly clear to whom the word of law was ultimately addressed. The dual status of the enslaved as both person and property, together with the architecture enforcement resulted, as I, did, I write in the book, in an odd and even paradoxical mission for the enforcers, and that is to suppress the person in order to protect the property. And the person to be suppressed was not necessarily imagined as a long suffering fellow human deserving of empathy and redress, but the potential insurrectionist. So I discussed this in the first chapter in which uh, fear is the overarching theme uh, while reflecting on Gabriel Prosser's failed rebellion. And again, I cite Winthrop Jordan. The specter of the Negro, wait, sorry, the specter of Negro rebellion presented an appalling world turned upside down, writes Jordan in White Over Black, a crazy nonsense world of Black over White, an anti-community, which was the direct negation of the community as white men knew it. In other words, it threatened a world where the concrete reality of white power and Black insubordinacy would flip, whether, where the world would be one of Black over White. So Gabriel, Gabriel Prosser, though, did not seek to become the master of his enslavers. His ambitions were rather unambitious in that regard. Gabriel only sought to have the same rights and relative freedoms as his fellow white artisans. In other words, the right to be a free wage laborer, to autonomously sell his labor on equal terms. He did not seek, to do he did not seek dominance, only a semblance of equality, albeit by any means necessary. Perhaps in having seen or recognized the enslavers as he saw or recognized himself, Gabriel did not seek to obliterate them. That journey within, for the bondsmen, does not always result in one's fear turning into projection or turning a complex phobia into a simple one. Yet the master, never having beheld the slave as anything other than an object, was not forced to contend with the slave's worldview, much less empath empathize with him. Perhaps this is why the enslaver could not imagine any other motive of the rebellious enslaved than revenge. So I'm gonna read now a fuller excerpt from chapter one. Um, and this one is going to be personal narrative. And um, I think it's just because uh, the, the, con the, you know, the overall subject of the book being about the Insurrection Act, um, particularly in the context of this presentation, can give you the impression of a sort of different kind of book, one that's really straight legal history. But in fact, um, I did write this in a hybrid style, uh, interweaving personal narrative and legal history with the intention of, of hoping that the personal narrative could help elucidate some of the themes that I discuss in the book. So uh, following off on uh, you know Winthrop Jordan's uh, discussion of uh, this, you know, upside down world, black over white. I'm going to just read a bit of personal narrative from the same chapter with the, you know, this, this, with the subtitle of the same name, black over white. I was a summer associate at a New York law firm that had been bombarding its wide eyed recruits with a sufficient variety of amusements to distract us from, from how dull the work was. I had danced around purchase tables at exclusive clubs with champagne flutes in my hand, 
I had been waited on by waiters who waltzed in synchronized movements around our dining table. I had watched Avenue Q. One afternoon, I was invited via group email to the top floor of the building to hear from a candidate for Senate. A partner had been supporting the Senate hopefuls campaign and was helping him raise funds. So I took a break from researching a very dry memorandum and shot up in the elevator to go check it out. After a brief introduction and tepid applause from the gathered audience, the candidate stepped to the front of the conference room. I remember listening to Standard Fair for a political address as the speaker promised what he would do if elected, his words weaving some nearby future that all of us in that very room could help bring into existence with our combined, and combined civic and financial efforts. What stands out most in my memory, however, is his emphasis on his heritage, which became a refrain of his speech. My mother is from Kansas, he kept saying, and my father is from Kenya. The candidate was eventually interrupted by the partner who had invited him to speak. New York law firms all had personalities, I had been told. This one, though relatively, relatively prestigious, was known to be a bit rough and tumble or plainly full of jocks. Accordingly, this man who had been made partner found it fitting to inform the audience, head shaking and hands waving in the air as if pre preventing a bar brawl, that this man right, right here was the only candidate who could bring together the voters of Illinois behind a progressive platform. This partner should know, after all, he was from there and as he knew, it was rare for the voters he was familiar with to rally behind a progressive, much less a black. A black? I remember asking angrily, rhetorically, a black what? A black shoe? A black dog? This is what I asked later that afternoon at another one of our scheduled amusements, holding hostage the sympathetic ear of a fellow, fellow summer associate. He listened intently, but appeared circumspect about carrying on the conversation. I couldn't blame him. Whenever I gathered with one or more black summer associates to chit chat in the hallway, I would periodically crane my neck to check for any disapproving onlookers and was always poised to disperse. In any case, right then in the conference room, I remained silent along with everyone else and simply scanned the other attendees to see if anyone was visibly offended. The candidate was as poker faced as the rest of us. After all, he was there to raise funds and the rest of us were getting paid actual corporate salaries. He did, however, invite us, all of us, to his fundraiser later that night. Later that workday evening, I entered a large event space where Barack Obama's fundraiser was being held. The event was sponsored by an African-American Lawyers Association, one of many such identity groups convened to professionally encourage Black lawyers who, at the time, comprised a single-digit percentage of all lawyers in the United States. We still do. Only an estimated 5%. Black women make up only 2% of the profession. Though absurdly low, these statistics don't mean anything to me. If equality and diversity are truly noble goals, then they will never amount to any particular number. Having spent a lifetime accustomed to being the only or, at most, one of the few Black people in any given room full of white people, I never believed that having more of us there would do anything other than cause alarm for everyone, everyone else. Given the widespread presumption in the United States of a white majority, there is an implicit threshold tolerance for diversity. Up to said threshold, my majoritarian hosts might view, might view my statistical presence as an extension of benevolence, a reflection of their tolerance and good nature. And after this tipping point, my presence would be a threat. I attended the fundraiser by myself, drawn by promised networking and the guests of honor. There were hors d'oeuvres, drinking, and sporadic dancing before an MC ascended to the spotlighted stage and hushed the crowd. When Obama finally came to the microphone, I didn't necessarily expect innovation. I didn't really have any expectations at all, having just heard him speak that afternoon. But I ended up being very surprised. I stood there and listened to him give the same exact speech that he'd given earlier that day, with one exception, and that was inflection. My mama's from Kansas, and my daddy's from Kenya. He said everything I had heard before, but in African-American vernacular English he code switched. There are moments in life that are anticipated while wholly unexpected and which while intelligible in the abstract are unintelligible in so-called reality. One such date was November 4th, 2008. I was sitting on the floor of an acquaintance's apartment awaiting the results of the presidential election. It would become a historic day, but I was nonplussed. Having lived through George W. Bush's first presidential contest, with the ensuing days of uncertainty, hanging chads, and eventual binding decision of the Supreme Court, 
I had been primed to expect a long night, if not week or month ahead. Even as the numbers continue to be tallied, tipping the weighted scale of electoral votes in the, in the Illinois Senator's direction, the logical outcome was still denied by my emotional truth. And then it happened. Without much bureaucratic fanfare, Barack Hussein Obama was proclaimed the 44th president of the United States. The results were definitive and uncontested. What we call history are moments that are accumulated in hindsight, rearranged to betray some narrative coherence and perhaps effective resonance. But that night after the election was called, I felt history as it was happening. That said, I'm not a sentimental person. In fact, I still have a sullen, sarcastic 14-year-old version of myself defending my underlying sensitivity against my mainstream incitement of hope. And yet that evening, I cried. Barack, Michelle, Malia, and Sasha walking out onto a large stage in various shades of red, black and red before a cheering crowd of supporters bypassed my cynicism for the time being. I'll just read one more small part from that to give you the theme. There is a reason why I found myself crying on inauguration day. When the Obamas stepped out of their car, which had emerged from a line of sturdy black cars lined up in slow moving presidential motorcade, I was afraid for his life. Obama beaming and waving at the crowd as he walked carefree with panache had choked me in tears as I imagined him being centered within some sniper's crosshairs, the target of some hidden assassin. Does this sound dramatic? I don't care because it's true. As it turned out, my early fears for Obama's life were not unfounded. News outlets eventually reported that Obama was experiencing a sharp uptick in death threats, up to four times more than George W. Bush, according to one account. In fact, Obama's election co coincided with the formation of a new far-right extremist group called the Oath Keepers, which, according to the hate group monitor Southern, po Southern Poverty Law Center, was founded in 2009 by a Yale Law School graduate named Stuart Rhodes. Self-described on its website as a nonpartisan association of current and formerly serving military police and first responders, the Oath Keepers are committed to fulfilling vows to take in to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The group's express enemies are the federal government and the threat of its overreaching powers, which they state include martial law. My fear for his life, however, was apparently intertwined with the spectacle of his inaug inauguration because I eventually forgot about it completely as I started to scrutinize the policies of his administration. As far as I was concerned, no amount of charm and intelligence could eclipse the fact that the President of the United States was, in all cases, a figurehead for a gargantuan bureauc bureaucratic apparatus that translates corporate policies into policy, corporate priorities into policy, and wages foreign wars for profit. It was, in hindsight, a startling shift from a former version of myself doing voter registration drives, drives in some of the poorest and mostly black neighborhoods in Philadelphia, purchasing seven different newspapers after Obama won, then buying and framing a screen printed image of his face above a caption reading, we made history, to a later incarnation who would feel a numb jadedness spread through her body while reading that the same man was helming an administration that deported more persons than any, any prior one. I knew, of course, that, that one man could not bear the full weight of, rep of representing my aspirations or be the sole cause of my disappointments. This is likely why my sudden and, and, and unanticipated excitement about Obama's election quickly evaporated. Perhaps it's, this, it's the same anticlimax that comes from applying for a job where your interviewer assures you that your role will be highly valued and your coworkers like family, only for the friendly facade to, quick, to give way almost immediately to the daily grind of mandanity and office rivalries. All that said, I wondered about the mindset of someone who would actually want to kill the president. I didn't know the details of the threats, which were not disseminated at the time, but I assumed they came from white nationalists of some kind, that in, in and of itself, that would be the answer. They were white racists wanting to harm the first black president. Yet the question still lingered unanswered. The intransigence of congressional leader, leaders notwithstanding, I didn't see how Obama's presidency was a significant departure from prior ones. What exactly did these people think he was gonna do? What were they so afraid of? Okay, so that gives you a bit of a flavor of the personal narrative interweaved in this sort of legal history with some theoretical flights of fancy. Um, but I, I figured I would spend some time talking about the actual writing of the book 
and the process of interweaving the personal narrative and the legal history. So my biggest concern um, in approaching this challenge was that the hybrid style would be too disjointed for the reader, maybe seem somewhat scattered and you know, uh, like the, the dots wouldn't be, uh, the, 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 con the, connect the connections between the different um, aspects of the book wouldn't you know, fully gel. Um, but the way I found to really, you know, interweave these these por uh, these portions, um, you know, and these seemingly disparate sections and even these styles of writing together was to emphasize the thematic linkages between the passages or among the passages. So again, the theme of that first chapter, which I was reading from, is fear. So as I introduced the concept of insurrection by link thinking of its antiquated usage during the antebellum period in the United States, often referring uh, to slave insurrections, I also consider, you know, uh, not only the fear of slave insurrection, but the fear of the enslaved person. And in the personal sections, I consider my own fears, largely in connection with the election of the first Black president. Um, and as I discussed in the excerpt I, I just read, uh, the fear among certain segments of society with regard to there being a Black president. Um, so this process not only allowed me to overcome a craft problem in writing the book uh, in this sort of hybrid style, but it ended up becoming sort of generative. Um, it allowed the material to sort of speak to me so that I can draw forth you know, the various themes that could, would then reverberate throughout the entire book. So as I go back and forth from past to present, you know, these enduring themes uh, sort of echo regardless of the time period I discuss in the book. So. The book spans from, you know, various uh, Insurrection Act invocations. It, it kind of goes through various Insurrection Act invocations throughout African American history, um, you know, starting from the antebellum period through to the Black Lives Matter, you know, protests in 2020 or threatened invocations rather, actual and threatened. And then you have my autobiographical interludes from various portions of my life. So. The emphasis on the thematic ties between the legal history and the personal narrative and even some of the sort of uh, theorizing and sort of philosophical or sometimes psychological sort of uh, explorations sort of brought to fore for me how history seems to be repeating itself in light of these recurring themes and how I, for example, am living history in that I'm experiencing in a way the re these repeating cycles of history within my own life. So interweaving the personal narrative, you know, sort of acknowledges that I'm not, you know, an omniscient narrator, so that I, but I have my own perspectives and my own biases. Um, I'm definitely an inheritor of this history, but I'm also attempting to craft my own personal mythology amid these larger culture wars. And I think that's something that every reader can definitely relate to. Um, and I thought giving myself permission to consider myself against this history also gives the reader the same opportunity or the invitation, you know, to think about how these events that happened, you know, so long ago, uh, sort of make or, or reincarnated in present times and sort of, you know, make themselves known in other guises within our own lives or within the lives of others that we're um, witnessing through news media, you know, and current events. So, and I think it also, uh, gives me an, uh, gave me an opportunity to take personal responsibility in crafting my own story and it's sort of making a meaning, you know, that could potentially sort of uh, emerge from these, uh, these past, past narratives and sort of, you know, uh, establish my own narrative agency amid, you know, the, the intrusions of, you know, of history and of, of course of law. Um, but I'll read a quick excerpt where I talk about history and my relationship to it, and certainly exposing myself, perhaps as an unreliable narrator. And the, the subtitle for this uh, uh, excerpt is in the book is Irrepressible Conflict. I never had much interest in history. The subject in and of itself was not the source of my disinclination. I was educated in a public school district in Suffolk County, Long Island, that was well-resourced and for that reason, drew residents to purchase homes in qualifying neighborhoods to ensure their children could attend one of or the primary, one of the primary or secondary schools encompassed by the district. I'm not ungrateful, but the entire experience was an ordeal. Much of the history I remember studying was presented under the moniker of social studies, a catch-all for certain fields of learning, including history and geography that unlike say math or English, 
didn't neatly fit into any other discipline within the school's curricula. As the proverbial only black kid in my class, I dreaded social studies in part because whenever the teacher would make mention of the word slave or slavery, several of the white kids would turn to glance or out outright stare at me. I would sit there at my desk on the receiving end of these looks and awkwardly pretend I wasn't being forced on display. Whatever we were discussing at that given moment was clearly causing the white kids to feel uncomfortable and their immediate response was to project that discomfort onto me. I didn't have the vocabulary at the time for this silent interaction laced with malevolence, but I remember how I felt, ashamed. I didn't know what I felt ashamed about, again, as I lacked the words to name the source of my feelings. However, what was being made clear with the uttering of the word slave or slavery and the almost accusatory stares in my direction was that my present day being was, being was directly associated with enslavement a badge of inferiority that was mine and mine alone to carry. Whenever slavery was discussed in those classrooms, not only could I count on the stairs, but also on the teacher's reassurance that we, meaning all of us present day beings learning social studies at that very moment, should not judge those historical enslavers by our contemporary morals. I never felt, inc felt included in that we, the bomb of historical relativism, which seemed intended to soothe the potentially guilty consciences of the white kids who managed to thereby, to thereby distance themselves from the karma of any ancestral enslavers while pinning the burdens of slavery and the enslaved onto me. Historical relativism buttressed their sense of innocence while their glares in my direction seemed to project some kind of guilt. Beyond the context in which I was supposed to be learning history, the subject matter itself presented barriers to my early willingness to engage with it. My grade school encounters with history consisted of names, dates, notable events, and geographical locations that I was compelled to memorize from, from textbooks and recite on test day, and which then, frankly, would promptly evaporate from my mind. The textbook presentation of history as a simplified, sanitized list of chrono chronological factoids largely devoid of narrative is, of course, intentional. The project of teaching history is inextricable from the project of imprinting students with a sense of nationalistic identity and patriotic fidelity. And this project at its core is paradoxical as it is guided by a single self-contradictory intention to teach what happened in the past without really teaching what happened in the past. It is a mission that is ultimately impossible. Okay, so ultimately this book really offers a correction to the disoriented sense that I felt while studying history in grade school um, and to some extent beyond. Um, but the, the Insurrection Act invocations that I discuss in the book, ultimately they serve as uh, plot points from which a narrative emerges that reconstitutes the typical trope of progress as discussed in the context of African-American history and reconsiders the story with the, the uh, narrative underpinning of, say, you know, almost an ongoing like civil war. So thinking about history as a sort of narrative was also instructive um, in light of the work of the legal scholar Robert Cover, who I cite uh, in my book. And in his essay, Nomos and Narrative, he writes that every legal prescription is insistent in its demand to be located in discourse, to be supplied with history and destiny, beginning and end, explanation and purpose. In other words, legal interpretations are made and understood in light of the broader cultural narratives that exist alongside and in tandem with legal conventions. So when the executive makes a proclamation of insurrection, it is not being done in a vacuum, but in light of the own meaning that the executive has of a given event, given event as well as certain prevailing cultural narratives with respect to which that proclamation would be understood. So that is on the one hand, on the other, law which dictates uh, and regulates human conduct is, is sort of a facet of these cult cultural narratives insofar as it erects a framework that could either facilitate a narrative possibility or create major obstacles to its fulfillment, you know, depending on who you are and what you're trying to do, of course. So law sets forth what is permissible and impermissible, often with consequences that range, can range anywhere from fines to imprisonment or even death. So what I call the legal construct in the book is not only fashioned in light of existing cultural narratives, but it is also a kind of container or a field of action in which a majority of narrative activity takes place, perhaps like a fishbowl that the insurrectionist attempts to jump out of. So what we understand to be history is often a larger story of this dynamic between law and its detractors, 
between an apparatus that defines and sanctions on the one hand and on the other, those who attempt to break out from the cages of these definitions and assert their narrative agency. So some enslaved persons or the civil rights protester, for example, have, may have, might have waged a, a battle for dignity and freedom and some white reactionary figures throughout time have waged their own battles to preserve their way of life, you know, both you know, insur in an insurrectionary manner. So although both have, might have engaged in insurrectionary activity, generally and up until the major narrative shift that occurred with the colloquial, colloquial use of the term insurrection to discuss January 6, only one group has been prone to be narratively understood as the insurrectionist. So for example, when George Wallace was obstructing black students from entering Alabama public schools, in light of the Brown v. Board of Education ruling, it was really George Wallace who was the insurrectionist. Uh, but that said, the focal point, uh, you know, in news media and you know the wider cultural narratives was typically on the mostly black civil rights protesters as somehow being disrupt the ones being disruptive of law and order. So we can even take a recent example with the Black Lives Matters Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 when Donald Trump threatened to invoke the Act, the Insurrection Act. Um, he did so in order to suppress the riots, vandalism, and arson that were coincident to the protests. And yet, given the reportedly at least one, you know, at least 1,000 reports of uh, police brutality, including tear gas and other facets of the militarized response to the protests, Trump could easily have channeled Lyndon B. Johnson's response to Bloody Sunday and invoked the Insurrection Act to enforce the First Amendment rights of the many peaceful protesters who were uh, demonstrating to assemble. So bearing in mind, uh, you know, critical race theory, not the new terminology that has become the bane of school boards across the United States, but the classical kind that endeavors to evaluate how the law might be applied disparately across racial categories. The Insurrection Act is one statute that clearly, you know, highlights the, the biases and inclinations of those who endeavor to interpret it. So which actors are cast as insurrectionists is, of course, in the eye of the beholder. So this enduring stigma of the black citizen as a potential insurrectionist, as I argue in the book, is reflected in the sort of dual status of the black citizen, which as a concept uh, continues to inhabit aspects of the antebellum pre-citizen status of being both person and property. The black citizen is both ward and enemy of the state, object and subject of the law. The oscillation of the act largely being used to suppress race riots, or AKA to suppress the person to protect the property on the one hand, or to enforce civil rights on the other lets, lends credence to this idea of the black citizen as an unstable object. So I'll just put this image up again. You will have it as we close out. Um, so keep this image in mind again, where I'm just gonna read quickly from page 235. So progress through this lens has been a series of advancements and retrenchments in a warlike contest. Even symbolic victories in this ongoing war, the most, the most significant in recent history being the election of Barack Obama, were then followed by white supremacist regression, such as the pre presidency of Donald Trump, the insurrectionist in chief who with the support of his follow followers effectively rebelled against the election of the first black president. The nature of this progress is also reflected in the interpretive pendulum of the Insurrection Act, insofar as it swings back and forth between its use to suppress so-called race riots and to enforce civil rights. The use of the act is ultimately a reflection of the precarious status of black citizens. The black citizen in the United States is akin to the unstable image highlighted in Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, which in the flicker of an eye can be seen as either a duck or a rabbit. Similarly, and despite the formal advances toward equality and freedom, black citizens have not emerged from the interpretive paradox of being deemed at once person and property, both ward and enemy of the state. Black citizens then are blurred and distorted in this double vision where we are paradoxically both victims and perpetrators, both relief, see both relief seeking and rioters, both integrated and insurgent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's extremely thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation. There's a lot to unpack there and I'm sure we will all continue to do so. Um, so yeah, a couple of questions here and audience members do feel free to throw other questions and comments into the chat at the right of your screen. Um, I was curious uh, if you can, if it's easy to describe briefly, what specific events were going on in 1807 
it, itself exactly. that got the act originally proposed and passed. I mean, why 1807 as opposed to the entire Right, exactly. So when I was looking at the legislative history, and this is something that, you know, uh, you know, other legal scholars and their sort of legal articles have looked at as well. Um, there's no legislative history of the Insurrection Act. So that means there's no documented sort of explanation or, um, you know, iteration of, you know, any debates around the, the time when it was passed. So it's unclear what the sort of um, immediate uh, sort of uh, what immediately prompted this legislation. But that said, it has uh, antecedents, and those are the Militia Acts of 1791. And um, so that that sort of introduced the concept of Congress delegating its authority to, um, in the, under the Constitution, to uh, call forth the militia in order to suppress, you know, you know, insurrections and whatnot. And it sort of delegated that to the president under certain circumstances. So uh, the Insurrection Act was, it was a sort of, um, a sort of reconstitution of the sort of the power set forth in the 1791 Militia acts. Now, so for the, some people say that the the it's really the Shays Rebellion that brought about you know the uh, original the original sort of need for the militia acts, or you know that was what, what was in mind when the the seventeen ninety one militia acts were enacted. However, I speculate in the book about you know just thinking obviously about the fact that colloquially, given the antebellum period. Uh, slave insurrections, you know, there was a major fear of slave insurrections at the time, <laughs> you know, so I, it makes me wonder, like, how could this not have been on anyone's mind? And in fact, the, you know, the silence itself sort of speaks to the, in some way, the uh, inevitability of, of the need for the act. Like, what is their debate? Because everyone knows what they're talking about, perhaps. I don't know, right? So I, but I play around with that. And I speculate on that in the second chapter. But also what's interesting is in the background, um, we have, uh, the Haitian Revolution, and sorry, I misspoke, the Militia Acts were 1792, and the Haitian Revolution started in 1791, and it ended in 1804. So, and that especially caused a lot of trepidation uh, in the slaveholding states about a similar uprising occurring there. Um, so, I don't, the answer is, I don't know, but um, I think it's interesting to speculate, given the background, obviously, of the general fear of enslaved insurrection and also the Haitian Revolution happening sort of, you know, around the time, you know, right before, maybe the year before the, the antecedent to the Insurrection Act was passed. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you say, it's evocative, the idea that there was not a specific triggering event that we know of but that it seems so obvious that, of course, the United States needs something like this because that is itself revealing about the mindset of the time. Um, so a viewer asks, uh, how can we as concerned citizens best participate in the current movements of social justice in this era of social media hysteria and fake news when so many public actions, including especially perhaps acts of civil disobedience are falsely labeled, you know, or caused, called right. or rioting when they're not, or called not peaceful when they are peaceful, et cetera. You know, that that is such an interesting question for me, especially because it's in the book um, and even in the timepiece that you kindly you know quoted, I'm so interested in the idea of labeling events in a particular way, which then constitutes a sort of reaction to those events depending on how they were labeled, right? So there, you know, there's a difference between sort of witnessing something with your own eyes and getting a sense of what is going on and then sort of having a label placed onto it, you know, which then sort of has its own, you know, sort of narrative, um, uh, sets sort of like a narrative engine, you know, in place, especially when it comes to, you know, legal interpretations that can then frame how the people involved in those events are treated. So as I said in the timepiece, when you say someone or a group of people are peaceful protesters, then it's like, well, let's, you know, protect their First Amendment rights. But when you say that they're rioters and insurrectionists, then you have like a police, you know, or even military crackdown on the very on those very same people. So I I'm having a hard time distinguishing between uh, our concepts of events and the actual events in and of themselves. And in that way, that brings forth this whole duck rabbit thing. And you know, and it also brings it, it also calls into question all of this the culture war over, and for example, January six and whether to call it an insurrection or not. And you know, there's all this back and forth, but ultimately, what they're fighting about or debating is how you know 
the people involved in you know these incidents and maybe people who could be seen to be related to those people should be treated from the from a law enforcement perspective right so um you know i i honestly don't know it's it's like there's so many layers of um I don't know if I want to call it deception, but I would say, I guess I would say layers of perception. Maybe that's a better way of putting it uh, between our, uh, between us and whatever events are being described to us, right? Unless you're there, it's really hard to know what happened and how you'd want to describe it. But we rely on the news media, you know, in the present tense. And then if we're thinking about the past, we're relying on historical narratives to sort of explain to us what happens. And even though we might have certain facts, it's the interpretation of those facts and the sort of implicit narrative that sort of, you know, leads us to believe that we really understood what was going on. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a sort of complete relative, relativist or say everything is subjective. I'm not really trying to do that either, but I think it's important to acknowledge the difficulty and really sort of perceiving reality accurately whatever that means, right? <laughs> That's another problem. Absolutely. Um, it also seems that for the most part, it's not up to the people participating in it and how it's going to be perceived for better or worse, which is... Exactly. Yeah. A, but even, I, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say that uh, uh, I was in the book, I actually have one chapter talking about the civil rights protests mm -hmm. in the context of thinking about specifically, you know, the Selma to Montgomery march, and then, of course, the desegregation of public schools. But what was so interesting is, you know, how uh, the civil rights protesters sort of had in mind how they would be perceived in the context of their demonstrations, and they used that as a sort of tactic in order to uh, force the hand of the federal government. So, you know, they knew that they were going to be beaten, essentially, and they even had test runs to sort of sort of remain as this in this sort of zen like calm while you know they're being you know they'd have play actors taunt them and beat them we've all seen you know the documentaries where we've seen these sort of reenactments but you know the idea was that you know under no circumstances that's this is the tactic should you sort of act in a violent manner because you know if you do that's going to take away from you know the ultimate goal of having these media representatives or media representations of this sort of excessive use of force and the violence of the state. So just by your mere sort of Zen-like presence, you're extracting, you know, the violence of the state, which is then uh, beamed across, you know, the media internationally, which then creates a sort of naming and shaming kind of, you know, international uh, state of embarrassment. So in a way, it's like they 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 calculated how they were be, would be perceived in order to advance their movement, which I think, you know, is obviously fascinating. Yes, that is a particularly good way of putting that. I think extracting is not a word that I've thought of before in that context. It's, it's very apt. Thank you. Um, one of the excerpts you read used the word majoritarian, which I think is a really handy general term that I don't hear a whole lot. Um, can you talk <laughs> a little bit about the meaning and usefulness of that word in our current social or political context? or? Right. So, I mean, so this is the thing in the, with the personal narrative, especially how it's placed and interspersed and where, where I put it, there's a way in which I'm playing with the, the sort of uh, current context. I'm playing that against the past. So in that, in that somewhere in that chapter, I think I talk about one of the, the main fears of slave insurrection had to do with, you know, population, because the more, you know, on the one hand with this personal uh, person property duality, it's like, as property, you know, the more uh, the, the slaves reproduced and, you know, like had, you know, children, that's more property. That's like your, your assets uh, increasing in value. But then the more of them there were, the more, you know, potential there was for a sort of, you know, uh, dangerous uprising sort of in the mind, you know, so there's this like, you know, the duality of the, of the perception also creates this kind of, you know, you know, a sort of a, a split mind as to how to sort of treat, you know, the enslaved person. So I was thinking about, you know, these anxieties over, you know, the, the population of the enslaved versus, you know, the white uh, citizens in a, in a given, you know, state, slave holding state, um, and sort of, you know, playing with that concept, you know, with this idea of like diversity and, and inclusion and, and things like that. But so that, so I liked that. That's why I liked the term majoritarian um you know because of the 
you know, it's like we live in a country with a white majority. And now, and I, I didn't get into this in the book, but, um, you know, I know that the, there have been, there's been talk about the great replacement theory that sort of in, might have influenced some, you know, uh, certain Trumpers or certain, maybe not, you know, the certain uh, sort of groups uh, involved with, you know, the either the insurrection itself or like in that community. And so, the, you know, I'm just, I was just interested in sort of referring to this kind of uh, population-based anxiety, right? And linking it to the one from, you know, the antebellum, uh, antebellum period, so. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a memorable one, I think. Um, good, so I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If that works for you, uh, audience members, do yeah. uh, add any final thoughts you have to toss in. Um, so I think it's striking that you're publishing your first book, right? At a time when we're seeing a sudden increase in book bans and challenges, especially of writers mm -hmm. of color and queer writers. Uh, right. Thoughts about that social moment in the context of the history of studying, not insurrection per se, but just consciousness of a variety of perspectives, perhaps? Well, you know, I, I would, I, I also, I, I think it's actually, a, you know, it, there's a way in which it's a scary moment. Nobody wants any, you know, people to ban books, but it's also, it, it shows that what we're dealing with is a sort of transformation in prevailing cultural narratives, which creates a lot of anxiety. And it's sort of a response, it seems to be a response to that because if you didn't feel threatened, you wouldn't wanna ban the book, right? So there's clearly, it's clearly, it seems to be some sort of response to the idea that these narratives are sort of, sh seem to be shifting in, you know, in certain directions and uh, that people are not entirely comfortable with, right? So who knows what the outcome of that, that could be like, you know, Ideally, I, I think with any sort of a sort of cultural sh changes and shifts, you're going to have this sort of, you know, uh, this pulse for retrenchment, right? And we we tend to there's not progress without, you know, sort of you know taking two steps back. So we we're, we're always sort of dealing with that back and forth. But um, you know, I it's it's like uh, you know, I it's it's hard to say to know what to say other than of course I don't think books should be banned, but it's a very interesting to even see that this is occurring because that means that it's it's representative of sort of a larger cultural shift that people seem threatened enough by to feel the need to respond to in that way. Um, you know, and I'd be curious to see if anyone, you know, involved with these bannings have actually read these books and uh, what they would think about them if they, mm -hmm. they actually read them. Yeah, um, it does seem like an awful lot of it is based on misinformation, although I'm sure I'm not acquainted with every situation. But yeah, thank you. Um, that is actually kind of a um, inspiring, oddly <laughs> inspiring way. <laughs> um, yeah, comment here. Um, classroom restrictions, uh, how to respond. I picture how this first person narrative about history and slavery in the classroom could lead to some teaching mm -hmm. moments and you're talking about your own experience and how perhaps some of those teaching moments were missed or wrongly used. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, what, because this is a trade book, it has a lot of academic aspects to it, mm -hmm. but um, I think the idea was, you know, to present it to a general audience so that the, um, you know, hopefully the personal narrative could sort of in, sort of more more fully engage the reader in the material. Like ultimately, I wanted it to be a pleasure to read, right? So I I would hope that you know a young person could pick it up, and you know the personal narrative, you know, which can sometimes even be irreverent, and you know also engaging in and of itself, you know, as it sort of has these thematic resonances, it can sort of help guide them through this history. You know, using me as the kind of you know the tour guide, right? and make it seem somewhat less intimidating. Um, you know, so I mean, it would be great for for that to be taught, you know, um, and not banned. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Good, so um, I just one more kind of favorite question here. So this is your first book and it's nonfiction, it's legal history, history and personal narrative, but you also write fiction and poetry. Do you feel comfortable sharing big project coming up next? Is there something we should look out for? 
Um, well, I don't have anything sort of on the, the immediate pipeline, but I do have, you know, I've written a, a, a number of stories that in them that could be a collection. So I have something that I would call a collection of short stories. Um, so, and many of them are set in the aughts, which now is like this sort of far, you know, far away time, which is so weird, but, you know, it's like, I was reading them recently and it felt like it was, it was a time capsule. People aren't looking at their phones. Like, you know, there's a lot, it just was very of a certain time. But in any event, I, I have been revisiting some of that and it would be nice for, you know, for that to come out. But um, I'm very sort of comfortable and happy in this sort of creative nonfiction space. Um, and I think it's because it allows you to sort of use all, all of your tools at hand, even, you know, with, with fictional writing, it's like a lot of scene setting and description and, you know, you know, creating a character, but you can create a character of yourself in your creative nonfiction, right? And I, when, I did, when I was writing this book, when I was writing the personal narrative, I was really sort of writing the character of me, so to speak. Like, obviously it was nonfictional, so it was true, but I wasn't really, I was really, you know, doing it in a way that served the larger narrative. It wasn't like just talking about myself for no reason. So, um, you know, I really like creative nonfiction a lot for that reason, because, you know, you can get some lyricism and obviously there, you know, uh, there's a lot of exposition and sort of, uh, you know, teaching moments. You can get in some theory like I really like that, you know, altogether. But, um, you know, I guess the answer is yes, I do have the, the short story collection that, you know, if someone could publish. That would be lovely. <laughs> That's great. We look forward to it. Good. Well, Hal and Ellen, thank you so much. Audience members, thank you as well. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation and I loved just sharing my ideas with your with your members. Excellent. Thank you.